Hello everyone, my name is Melissa Ladano and I'm one of the FPMRS trained urology attendings at Montefiore Albert Einstein. Today I'm very excited to be able to give you this lecture on the basics of stress urinary incontinence in the female patient. I have no relevant disclosures, but disclosures brings me right away to a major point. Incontinence happens and it happens to our patients. They may be embarrassed to bring this up to providers, so we are doing them a disservice if we don't ask about it routinely. The International Continence Society defines stress urinary incontinence as the involuntary loss of urine with effort or physical exertion. Some have advocated to change the terminology to activity-related incontinence so that patients do not confuse the term stress with psychological stress although this can be psychologically stressful for our patients. There are two main theories behind why women get stress urinary incontinence. The first theory depicted on the left is a loss of urethral support or hypermobility, essentially the backboard of muscles that used to compress the urethra during Valsalva are disrupted and therefore leakage occurs when interabdominal pressure is increased. The second theory is, there's, is there is a loss of sphincter tone at the level of the internal urethral sphincter or bladder neck. This is the rationale behind making a distinction between urethral hypermobility and, in, and intrinsic sphincter deficiency. In recent years, some would argue that this distinction is less important as it does not necessarily impact treatment selection. The Epidemiology of Lower Urinary Tract Symptoms, or EPI-LUT study, published in 2009, looked at the prevalence of lower urinary tract symptoms in the US, the UK, and Sweden. This cross-sectional population representative survey was conducted via the internet, and participants were asked to rate how often they experienced individual LUTs during the previous four weeks on a five-point Likert scale and, if experienced, how much the symptom bothered them. This was a final sample of 30,000 participants. The prevalence of LUTs was defined by two symptom frequency thresholds, i.e. at least sometimes and at least often for all the LUTs except incontinence where frequency thresholds were at least a few times per month and at least a few times per week. The prevalence of at least one lower urinary tract symptom at least sometimes was 72.3% for men and 76.3% for women, and 47.9% and 52.5% for at least often for men and women respectively. Specifically, for stress urinary incontinence, 31.8% of women were at least sometimes bothered by these symptoms. The risk factors of stress urinary incontinence include higher parity, increasing age, Caucasian race, smoking, lung disease, and obesity. All of these factors should be explored when taking a history from our patients. This algorithm comes directly from the AUA SUFU guideline on female stress incontinence, and it outlines the initial evaluation, which should include a history, focused physical exam, the demonstration of stress urinary incontinence via cough stress test, a post-void residual, and a urinalysis. Some further points that should be elicited during the history include trigger for incontinence, particularly important to differentiate from urgency urinary incontinence, keeping in mind that patients may have a mixed picture, frequency of incontinence episode, the amount of bother associated with incontinence as patients may be seeking reassurance but are not actually bothered by their symptoms, quantity of leakage, which you may assess by pad count, pad weight, or voiding diary, and gathering information regarding the patient's treatment expectations and goals. On physical exam, you are first and foremost looking to document the presence of stress urinary incontinence 
And this may be done in either a supine or standing position. You're assessing for concomitant pelvic organ prolapse, assessing for urethral hypermobility, which can be visualized or quantified with a Q-tip test, assessing for vaginal atrophy, and performing a focused neurologic exam. The urinalysis is performed for presence of UTI or to rule out or screen for microscopic hematuria. And finally, a PVR is performed to rule out urinary retention or overflow incontinence. What additional testing needs to be done? Should we be doing cystoscopy or urodynamics? Well, this is not entirely accurate, but I just wanted to make sure I still had your attention. The recommendations regor regarding additional testing are as follows. No cysto is needed in the index patient unless concern for urinary tract abnormalities are found. Urodynamics may be omitted in the index patient when stress urinary incontinence is demonstrated and performed in the non-index non patient. These recommendations are largely based on data from a landmark trial called the VALUE trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine. There are indications for performing either urodynamics or cystoscopy, and you can see them listed here. Additional evaluation should be performed in the following scenarios. Lack of a definitive diagnosis, inability to demonstrate stress urinary incontinence on exam, known or suspected neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, and abnormal urinalysis, urgency predominant mixed urinary incontinence, an elevated post-void residual, high-grade pelvic organ prolapse, or evidence of significant voiding dysfunction. Additional evaluation may be performed when there are concomitant overactive bladder symptoms, failure of a prior anti-incontinence surgery, or prior prolapse surgery. Now that we have reviewed the diagnostic process for stress urinary incontinence in our female patients, let's move on to the treatment options. Again, it is worth repeating that assessing patient bother with symptoms is critical because observation is a reasonable choice if in line with patient goals. There are both surgical and non-surgical options, and we will take these one by one starting with pelvic floor physical therapy. First of all, there is a lot of information out there on how to do pelvic floor strengthening, and patients may be getting information from a variety of sources, including Cosmo, and potentially from someone like Gwyneth Paltrow, who is promoting the use of the jade egg on Goop, and ultimately got some flack for this due to the expensive nature of some of these products. This information comes from the IUGA website, which if you don't know about it, is a great resource for providers and patients. It provides patient handouts for many urogyne diagnoses and treatments and provides them in many different languages. A description of how to do pelvic floor exercises and with what frequency is shown on this slide. A landmark trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at mid-urethral sling versus pelvic floor physical therapy. This was a multi-center randomized trial performed at multiple Dutch medical centers in which patients were randomized to mid-urethral sling versus pelvic floor PT with outcomes measuring after, measured after 12 months. This study, study showed that subjective improvement was reported in 90.8% of women in the surgery group and 64.4% of the physiotherapy group. Subjective cure was reported in 85.2% of the surgery group and 53.4% of the physiotherapy group. There was, a, however, a selection bias in women with a preference for surgery may have been more likely to participate in this study because they otherwise would have received 
initial physiotherapy according to Dutch guidelines. There was also a high crossover rate, 49% among women assigned to the physiotherapy group, which complicates the interpretation of these results. Additional non-surgical options include vaginal inserts, which provide tension-free anterior vaginal wall support to prevent leakage. Poise Impressa is a device similar to a tampon with an applicator and a string attached for removal. In June of 2014, we predicted that Kimberly Clark would introduce a line of pessaries branded as Poise Impressa bladder supports. The test market introduction occurred in September into the Kansas City market. This followed the acquisition of Kuntipi, an Israeli company, for greater than $90 million. This article published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2008 included 60 women with stress urinary incontinence. The study methods included a seven-day control period followed by 28 days 28 days with the device for eight hours. Pads were weighed during each period. 85% of women achieved greater than or equal to 70% reduction in pad weight gain. Adverse events included some discomfort, vaginal pain, and spotting. Finally, incontinence pessaries with a knob that can be placed under the urethra and again provide support to the anterior vaginal wall and prevent leakage. Now moving on to surgical approaches. Open abdominal retropubic suspensions or urethropexies such as the birch copal suspension is a procedure that provides elevation of the anterior vaginal wall and paravesical tissues towards the iliopectinal ligament of the pelvic side wall using two to four sutures on either side. The Marshall Marchetti and Kranz procedure is the suspension of the vesico-urethral junction or bladder neck onto the periosteum of the symphysis pubis. This study, published in the New England Journal in 2007, randomized women to birch versus autologous fascial sling. It included 665 participants with 24 months of follow-up and found that at 24 months, success rates were higher for women who underwent the sling procedure than for those who underwent the birch. For both, the overall category of success was 47 versus 38% and the category specific to stress incontinence was 66% versus 49%. However, more women who underwent the sling procedure had urinary tract infections, difficulty voiding, and postoperative urge incontinence. You can see here the rates of adverse events related to the birch copal suspension. The highest rates are in the UTI and wound complication categories. Moving on to our next surgical options, a pubovaginal sling. In this procedure, the fascia is typically harvested from the abdominal rectus fascia or fascia lata through a secondary incision. Other materials such as porcine dermis, cadaveric fascia, Teflon, Gore-Tex, Marlex, Silastic, and Mersaline have been used, but complication rates are higher with those than autologous fascia. The harvested fascia is then passed under the proximal urethra or bladder neck and tunneled up to be tied above the rectus fascia. Similarly to the birch, the highest complication rates associated with pubovaginal sling are wound complications, UTI, and de novo urgency incontinence. Finally, the synthetic mid-urethral sling has two well-studied approaches, including the retropubic and transobturator approach. A cystoscopy should be performed after the placement of the sling to assess for bladder, urethral, or ureteral injury after trocar passage. The newest variation on the synthetic sling is the mini sling, a single incision sling which is placed via vaginal incision and anchored in the obturator membrane. Unlike transobturator and retropubic slings that are designated to be placed in a tension-free manner, 
Mini slings are optimally placed with closer approximation to the urethra. For some historical perspective, the first tension-free vaginal tape sling was described in Sweden by Olmsted and Petros in 1995. The FDA approved the first mid-urethral sling in the U.S. in 1998, and since then, over 3 million mid-urethral slings have been performed worldwide. However, a synthetic mid-urethral sling is not always the right answer and should be avoided when there is concern for a urethral vaginal fistula, urethral erosion from mesh, an intraoperative urethral injury, or a urethral diverticulum. When passing a retropubic trocar, we are close to some important structures pictured here. If you're too medial, you can injure the dorsal nerves of the clitoris, and if too lateral, the external iliacs or epigastrics are at risk. A Cochrane review was performed looking at data comparing transobturator and retropubic mid-urethral slings, including 55 randomized control trials at, with both short and long-term follow-up. Subjective cure rates range from 62 to 98 percent in the transobturator group and 71 to 97 percent in the retropubic group. There are some important differences to note with regard to complication rates. Transobturator slings have higher rates of groin pain, whereas retropubic slings have higher rates of bladder perforation and urinary retention. We do have long-term data on TVT retropubic sling looking at 90 women with a mean follow-up of 16 years and nine months. Over 90% of the women were objectively continent and 87% were subjectively curd or significantly improved. The next procedural option is urethral bulking agents. Urethral bulking agents have the advantage of being used in the clinic setting under local anesthesia with minimal morbidity. Classically, they have been used for women with intrinsic sphincter deficiency. However, with growing concerns over the uses of mesh, they have been used more broadly. Several bulking agents are no longer on the market due to particulate migration, local abscess reaction, or lack of efficacy. Collagen, which was the standard agent, is no longer available. There are currently four FDA-approved agents in clinical use. Pyrolytic carbon-coated zirconium oxide beads, or Durasphere, calcium hydroxyapatite, or coaptite, silicone microparticles, or macroplastique, and polyacrylamide hydrogel, or Bulkamid. Bulkamid has gained popularity in the world of urethral bulking. It is, again, a non-particulate homogenous gel which consists of a smooth hydrogel and contains no microparticles. The unique delivery system, including the short length scope and rotatable sheath, is helpful to precisely inject the material in the short female urethra. From 2006 to 2011, 256 women underwent periurethral bulking with polyacrylamide hydrogel and were assessed in a single center study in the UK. Women were assessed with at least yearly quality of life surveys. Median follow-up was 38 months. 82% of patients reported cure or significant improvement at three months. Importantly, this high satisfaction rate was maintained at final follow-up and was reflected in quality of life surveys. There were no reported adverse reactions and no significant safety concerns. This is a single center study from Germany with seven-year follow-up. The primary endpoint was patient satisfaction measure, measured on a four-point scale as cured, improved, unchanged, or worse. Secondary outcomes included the number of incontinence pads, quality of life survey data, reinjection rates, and perioperative and postoperative complications. A total of 67.1% of the patients reported feeling cured or improved after bulkamid injection. 
11.1% reported no change, and 2.3% reported worsening of incontinence. A total of 19.5% of patients received a subsequent urinary incontinence procedure. Postoperative complications were transient, prolonged bladder emptying time was reported in 15% of the patients, and urinary tract infection in 3.5%. Here you can see the efficacy of different bulking agents again, all with a somewhat wide range of efficacy rates suggesting the need for more long-term data. The same study reports adverse events and reinjection rates. The highest rates of adverse events centered around transient urinary retention, UTI, and migration of the material used. A single center randomized trial from Finland compared the retropubic TVT to Bulkamed with one year follow up. This study was published in the Journal of Urology in 2020 and included 224 women. 111 underwent TVT and 113 underwent bulking injection with Bulkamed. Both were done under local anesthesia only. The sling was adjusted to a cough test of 2 to 300 cc's, and Volcomed was done with a four injection cushion technique. Outcomes were measured at one year. This study compared satisfaction scores of 80% or greater on a visual analog scale of 0 to 100. This measure was reached in 95% of the TVT group and 59.8% of patients treated with polyacrylamide hydrogel. There are new treatment options underway for stress urinary incontinence, including cell therapy, androgen receptor modulators, and autologous muscle-derived cells for urinary sphincter repair. One potential medical therapy for stress urinary incontinence is duloxetine, a serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor approved in 2004 for the treatment of depression and painful diabetic neuropathy. It's be believed to facilitate the bladder to sympathetic reflex pathway, increasing urethral and external urethral sphincter muscle tone. Some of the adverse events, however, include suicidal thoughts, syncope, and falls. It is approved in Europe, however, has not yet been approved in the United States. A systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized control studies evaluated the surgical intervention for the treatment of stress urinary incontinence in women. This network plot shows the number of women with a cure of stress urinary incontinence symptoms. Circle size reflects the number of women and line width reflects the number of direct comparisons. In summary, mid-urethral sling, copal suspensions, and retropubic slings were found to be more effective. In summary, current treatments including pelvic floor physical therapy, vaginal incontinence devices or vaginal inserts, urethral bulking agents, or open surgical procedures include birch copal suspension or pubovaginal slings. There are potential treatments underway, including cell therapy, intravesical balloon inserts, or selective androgen receptor modulators. The future of all of this is likely personalized treatments. I wanted to end by saying that as you all know, a surgeon should have many tools in their toolbox. It is not a one size fits all approach. And shared decision making process between the physician and the patient is one of the most critical aspects of providing the best care that we can for each individual patient. I wanted to thank the Empire Series faculty and residents for the opportunity to give this lecture. I also wanted to take a moment to thank my colleagues at Montefiore Albert Einstein, who are pictured here, Dr. Sylvia Sudakani, Dr. Nithya Abraham, and Dr. Whitney Clearwater 
for their support and expertise. Thank you to all that are listening and looking forward to having the opportunity to be with you live to go over some in-service questions and answer some of your questions. Thank you.